them take over the panel. So here in studio, we've got David Feeder, the validator himself. You're looking great, David. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, how's it going? Uh, awesome, man. And uh, we've also got here Gamma. Hey. For, well, G4MM4.io. Gamma. Make Say the four like, like an A. Gamma. Right on. Gamma. Uh, welcome. And uh, you're somebody who knows a lot about the infrastructure of uh, Ethereum validators, Pulse Chain validators, and uh, it seems like you've contributed a lot. And so we're thrilled to have you here in person in Austin as well. Thanks for being here. Great. Now, I am a contributor. Hell yeah. That's, that's all I'm going to say about that. <laughs> And uh, also, we have RH Maximalist. What's going on? What's happening, everyone? What's happening? Just got like a, I'm on an undisclosed location. Got some uh, coconut here. Just eating the <laughs> crack of coconut open. Eating that. Joining you all for uh, amazing big brain conversation. What's happening? Awesome. And, you know, the three of you combined, I think, have helped a lot of people understand what it means to be a validator. So, I'm going to let you guys take over. But first of all, I have to ask you, um, you know, like, uh, what's up with this idea of me sharing my seed words to $10,000 today? <laughs> Not recommended usually. Yeah. Correct. Um, yeah. Highly discouraged. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm going to be speaking later today about it. But um, yeah, you can check out my Twitter if you want to play along and but after this panel, because because this is going to be a good one. So without any further ado, I'm going to let you guys take it away. Sounds good. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks. Cool. Thank you. Usually when I share my seed words, it's via tattoos and stuff like different people, different bodies, different locations. That's usually the, the preferred way, I think. Uh, David, back me up on this, right? Oh, absolutely. I agree. <laughs> yeah. Um, I prefer passphrases and seed words as a, as a nice mm -hmm. little cushion. A little buffer for security, separated into two physical locations that aren't like together, right? You don't travel with them together. You don't store them together. Um, and what, that's what, that's what the, is the passphrase? Uh, you, you, just said, you just said that word. What is a passphrase? It sounds like it's two words put together, but is it different than a password? Well, uh, yeah, a password is how you log into a website. It's a credential, like. I mean, honestly, you could consider it to be like a private key for a crypto wallet is like a password, right? It's your password to get into your account. Now, passphrase, 12, 24-word seed phrase, right? 256, well, 4,048 4, seed words for, a, for, a, for seeds, 12, 24, 36, whatever amount generates... Um, your account, right? Your account one, your account two, account three. Uh, the passphrase is a 25th word that adds a lot of randomness and like 24 words plus a 25th word that will create an entirely different set of accounts. And you have to have both of them or else you don't get access to any of your money because your pass, your seeds plus your passphrase is how all those accounts are actually generated. Um, then they generate the 128 bit addresses of like say Ethereum. You have the seed words, they generate a uh, private public RSA keys, private public keys. The last 40 bits of the public address that's generated is your actual <laughs> Is like the hash of that is is the actual uh, address zero x then a string of numbers. It's actually the last forty. And that, that's all techno jumble, whatever. But um, just keeping your passphrase, and so just imagine that your your passphrase is like just a twenty fifth seed word. So it's not actually like people confuse like the MetaMask password, which is how on local storage in your MetaMask in your browser, it encrypts your your private key 
in local storage in your browser and it's with your password and then it uses that password to encrypt your <laughs> private key and so you can get into your account on your into your um, browser but that's not how your accounts are generated because you're gener they're generated with the 12 word seed word right mm -hmm. so you don't need the password to um, to generate your accounts, you just need your 12 word seed phrase. And you can take that 12 word seed phrase, move it to a different uh, computer if you lose your password. So it's, like, it's an like encryption mechanism just to get into your MetaMask account, right? It's like a fundamental difference between passwords and passphrases and seed words that you really, really need to understand. Like people who, if you don't understand like the fundamental difference between the three as a user, then you need to watch some videos, right? And then understand like the use case for all three, why they're important, and then how to secure them all. And they should they should be stored in separate locations, like I said before, like all three of them <laughs> would be preferable. You don't want to keep your seed words, your passphrase, and your MetaMask password like in your wallet <laughs> that can get pickpocketed or anything. Although... Yeah. The, I did see one community member like a year ago say that he felt most secure keeping his 12 word seed phrase like in steel, like we recommend for his treasure or his ledger, like on him, like in his pocket, like while he's at work, like driving around town. I was like, that's a horrible idea. I mean, you can, can you like take your floorboard and like, <laughs> like throw it in your floorboard in your house or, you know, like, you know, get a safe and like, don't put it in your living room. Don't put it in your bedroom, which is honestly the worst place to put your stuff is like a safe in a closet in your master bedroom, because that's like the very first place that burglars like look apparently from re research that I've done. So, you know, think about where you're storing your keywords too. Um, a video that I watched, this is about physical security, which is also important, right? Because once you've, secured your stuff digitally you've taken your seed words off of the internet right you've written them down on a piece of paper and then now they've never been on a like never a photo never you didn't copy them into a text document saying oh, i'm good and then your computer sends them to the cloud automatically like like i use a mac i like macs but i understand that anything that goes to the desktop is instantly sent to the cloud even if i try to stop it it's just assume that it's instantly in the cloud. Um, and if, if anybody gets access to your cloud account, they can probably recover anything that's been on your desktop. Well, so you can turn off. Don't keep your seed words on your computer. Yeah. You can turn off iCloud too. I mean, that's something I always do. I never, you I never can. Yeah. I'm just saying like most people aren't going to do that and they're going to go, oh, I'm good. It's only on my local computer. I'm like, is it really? Did you go through the 15 steps you need to do to verify that no information's hitting the internet from your local computer? Uh, if I use a Linux, if I install Ubuntu Linux on a computer, a fresh install, there is no online anything. I, I'm perfectly guaranteed that like none of that stuff is going on the internet because I set up the computer. There is no default cloud service like login thing that I'm logging into some service that's automatically sending my data. But with my Mac, I have my iCloud and then it's on by default and you have to turn that off. And then it's, I would just recommend if you have a Mac and even if you think your iCloud isn't, don't trust that your, your stuff's not being shared with Apple in any file system, like not your desktop, not your, your downloads, whatever. Just assume that Apple's gonna get your stuff, which, which only, like I'm only concerned with that, when it comes to like passphrases or passwords or, or not even passwords, but like, uh, oh shit, my, my son's, I have to decline this one. Boom. My kid's trying to call me, but like seed words, right? Would... You, you write them down on a piece of paper and they never go on your phone and never go on your computer. And don't assume that you're smarter than you think you are because I know a lot of smart people that have getting, gotten royally screwed because they thought they were so smart that they were like, oh, I don't need to do these basic security measures like write the seed words down because I know how to use my computer. And if I just, I can keep a text document on a computer and I can encrypt it 
and put it on a USB. And they're like, well, in the time it took you to write that to a test document and then put it to an encrypted USB, was it automatically shared with some cloud service? I don't know. I wouldn't trust that. And I think I know what I'm doing, probably more than average. And I don't trust Apple not to get everything on my computer. So I don't put anything on my computer that I don't want anybody to see. Right. And I mean, I could turn off iCloud and everything, but even if I turned it off, I would assume that they have access to my stuff. Just assume the worst case. Right. Mm. I mean, that's the best case when it comes to seed words anyway, and passphrases and stuff like that. Never put them online ever. Right. And then going to physical security, think about if somebody were to burglarize your house randomly, like they don't even know that you're in crypto, right? This is the thing you got to think about, like the next level. It's like just you're a random house on the street and then nobody knows, but you got like a Lexus in your front, in front of your car. They're like, oh, this guy might have some money. Let me burglarize their house. But then now your hardware wallets are all backed up. And, but then you're, you have a safe in like your master bedroom closet or whatever where's the first place they're going to look probably the master bedroom closet (laughs) so maybe you want to store that stuff not in like the place that they're most likely to go because how long does the burglar have in your house before you're aware i mean i got security so probably within 10 minutes they're probably cops are my front door but within that 10 minute period what can they steal what do i care about well, I really didn't give a shit about they steal clothes and random stuff, but I sure care about my hardware wallets, my seed words. Mm-hmm. This so, shirt is Burberry, so actually you know, I do care those, about clothes. Well, yeah, I mean, well, you should probably put that into a safe. Maybe you want to, you know, get some, you know, on-site security for that shirt. Um, but most people aren't billionaires doing on-site security that can guard their stuff, right? You go on vacation, you go to work, Right. And not everybody, the, a lot of people are concerned about like, oh, if I'm very flashy, then I'm going to be targeted. I'm like, yes, that's a concern. But then you also got to be concerned about the random act of violence. And you're going to also be concerned about the random burglary that happens. And just don't make it easy for them. Because they probably don't even know that you, you're in crypto. They don't even know anything about hardware wallets. But then now you just put all your stuff like on your office desk. Like your hardware wallets, your seed words are like laying on right on top of your desk. And they just walk in and they just like scoop everything up. And you're like, well, that wasn't very secure, was it? You know, yeah, they, it's a physical David, security problem. David, David, what do you think about uh, only living in an apartment, park, parking a Toyota Corolla outside the door and never going on vacation? Is that uh, what you typically do to, to make sure that your validator doesn't get compromised? Uh, yeah, I mean... No, I mean, you need, like, physical security, too. Cameras, dogs, uh, people with tools and freedom seeds and stuff like that. So, yeah, you really got to protect them, at least it, for, for me anyway, you know. And then as far as, like, seed word plates, yeah, hide them, like, real well, like, in your, like, like somewhere nobody will ever find them. That's that's my advice for that, for sure. And then, so let's talk about validating, right? Because that's why everybody's here to listen to us three, right? So... Sure. So sure. yeah, let, let's, let's pivot a little, if you guys don't mind. So real quick, we'll just kind of tell the audience what is validating, what are what are the three of us doing? So Pulse Chain is obviously a fork of Ethereum, and they're on proof of stake, right? So they, they have what are called validators. So you basically take your coins, and you lock them up on a computer, and then you're mining the blocks, and you're processing the transactions, and you get part of the gas fees. Right, so that's what Ethereum is doing, and that's what we're doing here on Pulse Chain. So now the, the three of us here are, are kind of our claim to fame is between the, th- the three of us, gentlemen, you know, Ma- Max has pretty much the most videos, right? He's got how many AMAs did you do? Like 50 shows or 40? I think we're up to 25, AMA 25. number 25. Okay, all right. And so... I, I, cause I always tell people, you know, when they want more information and they want to watch something or just kind of get more info, I, I always point them to your videos and then, Thanks. and then, and Gamma, you've got the, really the, the telegram group is where we all hang out right in your, in your place. 
where everybody yeah. can go there and, and kind of ask questions. But that's more for the guys who are hands-on. If you want to build one of these computers yourself at home, you can talk to us in Telegram. We'll we'll try to help you, but in my opinion, it's it's hard to help people over Telegram, you know, because you know we can't really see the screen, and you're just sending us text. Um, so my kind of specialty is I've been actually doing calls with people, getting on Zoom. They screen share their validator with me, and then I just basically walk them through it step by step and really hold their hand. I've been doing the same thing sometimes. Nice. All right. Yeah. Yep. So, so, you know, me personally, like I'm, I love it. I've, I've always been a crypto miner. You know, I, I did a little Bitcoin back in the day, Ethereum. I missed out on the master nodes on dash when I was a, a younger man. And that's what stuck with me. And that's why I'm here today. And I'm obsessed with validating on pulse chain. Cause I know, I know where it's going to go. Right. And uh, what's what's really cool today is I haven't checked the price today, but, you know, yesterday or the day before you could get one validator, like one stake of 32 million pulse. What was it? Two grand. Right. Two thousand bucks. Yeah. I, I saw it at seventeen hundred. It's so up from there, but it's that's, pretty good. Yeah. Um, it's a good deal. Yeah, I good. mean, so there's a couple couple corrections there. I mean, so when you're validating, you you send your PLS to the to a contract and it actually gets burned. Most people aren't aware of that. And then once you be, once your validator keeps are active on the network, which takes, you know, a, two days, like 18 hours, one to two days, let's say one to two days, and you're actually validating, all the gas fees for all the users is burned by EIP 1559. It's like 100% burned, all the gas fees that are paid. You get tips, the priority fee, and they get the inflation, which is, Right now, it's like 31 PLS per epoch, which is 5.5 minutes, right? 270 epochs per day comes down to like 10,000, 11,000 PLS per day per validator, which is, you know, free money. Like, mm -hmm. whatever the price is, at per validator, I made like 10,000 PLS a day, real regardless of the price, which is pretty, pretty fantastic. But Gamma, but Gamma, I saw in the chat like 50 times that. Everyone here is down 99%. What are you going to do about that? Uh, I'm going to keep my validators. And uh, if we're down 99%, then maybe I can triple the number of validators that, I, that I'm running. Yeah. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm on a mission to double my validator count right now. So if the FUD is massive, then thank you for giving me free or not free, but cheap PLS so that I can dollar cost average and I can get more validators. Now, although I don't talk about price, if they're cheaper, then I can get more tokens, more coins, and then I can run more validators to support the network. There you go. And then there I are... get more familiar with running a validator. And then I can go, okay, how many validators can you run a machine? Well, let me test that theory. Is I has put as many as I possibly can afford on a machine. And I'll, I'm not going to tell you how many validators I have, uh, but it's enough that most people can run them all in one machine. Yeah. So don't even worry about that. <laughs> the, the theoretical, I've, I'm, the, the most I've still ever seen on one computer is a thousand stakes and it works fine. You can do more no. than a thousand though. Oh, you Depends can, on no. your hardware. Okay. You okay. Can. It, wow. It's about RAM, CPU. Yeah. So, I mean, you're talking, you're not doing a thousand validators on like a 32 gig bare man machine, but you got like 128 gigs of RAM with, with an increased amount of CPU. Okay. You can run a thousand, you can run two thousand validators on that. Right. It's more about bandwidth at that point, which is the problem. Mm. So you're gonna hit you're gonna hit an issue with peering, and then all those validators are testing, and there's gonna be a large amount of those validators that are in the sync committee. And there's right, and so the more validators you put on your computer, the more bandwidth, the more packets that have to go back and forth <laughs> to the network. To, to validate, to attest all these blocks. Yep. And it's not a, a huge amount per validator. It's a very, very small incremental yep. increase in the demand yeah. on the server. But when you, you're talking thousands of validators, not recommended. But you can run a thousand for sure. Yep. Um, if I've been asked seriously with people who run thousands of validators, and I said, you want to cap it like a thousand. And these are with like they got like the best hardware 
in their own private data center, double back, like they have a private data center and they're like, hey, Gamma, you kind of know something about this. Like how many validators can I put on a machine? I was like, well, what kind of hardware are you running? Oh, you bought the best hardware you can because you're running a thousand validators. Well, you might want to cap it at a thousand because when we're in a bull market and there's a huge amount of demand, then that means a huge amount of transactions. And then you're going to be at, right. It's just limit the load on your computer. But I mean, like a normal person, this is, that's the edge case. That's like a couple yeah. people. People yeah. are, we're aware of a couple large wallets that are out there that are running a lot of validators. Right. Yep. I would like and they're to see doing the, a really good job. I would like to see the H top uh, screenshot of running a thousand. Just literally, I just want to see how much memory it's using, how much CPU, uh, oh. even the bandwidth being able to capture that. I would like to see those stats. That would be super fascinating too, to kind of measure these things. Oh yeah. Last I checked the CPU was at like 3% utilization. It's just, just the core I seven. The RAM was out of where I was using 32 gigs of the 64 gigs. So about half the RAM. Mm -hmm. And I, I need, I'll need to check on the bandwidth, but I'll shoot that over to you. Yeah. I'll give you some stats I, on that. Mine's my, I'm running 64 gig with, you know, several validators. And sometimes I'm running like 48 gigs of RAM, but I got the cache set at half, which is normally, sometimes it only takes a like 20, it, because uh, Geth, will limit the amount of, of um, RAM that you actually use. So you can right. tell it to use 32 gigs of RAM, but then it'll actually use like 20, right? It says Go garbage collection is only 20 gigs and it yeah. limits you down from the 32. Right. But when when you're looking at like on HTOP, then it says an amount, but is that really the amount of active memory that's being used? Probably not. Yeah, especially with Aragon, which is a thing that people need to be aware of. If you use an H top and Aragon, you can't believe the RAM usage because there are some things that happen where it doesn't report accurately, mm. and that's a, a bug or something to be aware of. Which, which with H top and Aragon, the RAM usage that you're seeing when you run it is not the correct RAM usage. So there's mm. the cache and the active memory are different. And so you got to be aware of that. It was an interesting tweet. program to kind of figure out. Mm -hmm. It was an interesting tweet. I don't know if you guys saw it about um, no validators not equal nodes. And the guy, uh, I think he True. pulled the deposits from the contract, and it was 573 deposit addresses. Yeah, deposit addresses. 573 deposits. So you could look at those as nodes. And then but there's 37,000 validators. So I did the quick math, and it was like, 65 validators average per node. You know, we know there's more and less, but on average, yeah. I thought that was interesting. Um, so there's a lot of people running a lot of validators. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I would not recommend somebody like buy brand new hardware and pay like five grand to run like one validator. Yeah. No, like no. you're going to run 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 validators on that one machine because you need to make it worth your while to actually buy the hardware, run it, have the battery backup and all the, the hardware requirement, right? Because like I, I always re reiterate with people is the 32 million PLS that's required to the stake per validator isn't a cost because you get that back. It's burned initially. And then when, when you withdraw, it's reminted. Yes. Which is a, a nuance that most people don't realize. Just like with hex stakes, it's hex is burned. You get T-shares. And then when you end your stake, you your T-shares go out the window, right? They get burned or whatever you want to say, and you get back your principal plus your interest. Mm -hmm. with, with staking, the same thing happens. You burn your 32 million PLS, you get an active validator, and then when you withdraw your validator, you exit your validator, and then you withdraw your PLS, and then it's effectively reminted back into your wallet, and then you probably were withdrawing right over time so your your actual earnings, your inflation that you were getting, the thirty one plus sometimes it's like a thousand PLS per epoch. Sometimes it's usually thirty one, thirty two right now mm -hmm. at the current what thirty seven thousand validator count that we have now. And then you you get that money back. So it's actually I don't consider it to be a cost. So I don't think people should factor it in as a cost of doing business. You're like because it's like just a deposit. It's like it's 
you still own the PLS. It's still over here. You still have control over it. Nobody else has any control over it. Um, but the cost is your internet. It's your power. The cost of actually buying the equipment, which mm-hmm. could be, you know, substantial or maybe I know of a guy, he got some secondhand server, very good hardware, like 300 bucks. Yeah. From oh, like, you know, center, some, yeah. some place that has old uh, enterprise servers and they, you know, the auctions or hardware auctions and stuff like that. That's an like option. 200, right? $300 for a 128 gig server. That's a few years old or whatever, but it Linux runs on really old machines. And it runs really well on stuff that, like, Windows stopped working on you know, like five years ago, and then you throw Ubuntu on it, and it's, it's like this is perfectly fine. Yeah, it's fast. Yeah, yeah. I, I've done it myself. It's great. One of, the nice, one of the really nice things about this too is, yeah, we're using all open source software, so all you got to do is get the hardware, and then Ubuntu's free, Pulse Chain's free, everything else you just you just download for free, right? That's all you got to get is the hardware. That's it. That's the really, that's like yeah. the first initial investment. And then you need the pulse and then you're pretty much up and running. That's really all you need. It's, it's, it's really not too bad, you know, I, cause I, I've been working with some clients. If you're, if you don't know anything about computers, right? If you are really not computer savvy, you're not going to have a good time. You're, you're not going to have fun. It's pretty, it's a little challenging. You got to use the terminal. In, in Linux, you know, the old black and white screen with like the DOS prompts, like you really got to get in there. But if, if you're a little more comfortable, then people, you can do it yourself. You can do it at home. And it's, you know, I highly recommend it. I, I recommend anybody who, you know, if, if you want to get more pulse and you've already got a bunch of pulse, especially if you can do, in my opinion, like 10 validator stakes if you've got 320 yeah. million pulse to me that's a really good number because you get 10 stakes each stake earns about a dollar a day worth of pulse so you're looking at about 300 bucks a month give or take and, and that's it's just this is the easiest and cheapest yeah. mining i've ever done in I, my life i i've i've done ethereum testnet like with prodder like Guerle, ethereum for like two years before like the whole time Pulse Chain was in development. I'm on Ethereum's testnet doing it. And I've ran the map and 10 validators on Ethereum was my number to make it worthwhile for me to run an Ethereum. Pulse Chain is so much more affordable. So you could much more affordable to get 10 validators on Pulse Chain. And I would also say if you're going to start and you're going to buy hardware, you probably want to, your goal should be maybe 10 validators to make it kind of worthwhile to buy hardware. Now, if you had a, computer that you weren't using already well that just brought down your cost right there because you can throw ubuntu on that thing even if it's 10 years old well i don't know about 10 years maybe maybe that's what push in it but yeah call it pretty five. old yeah. right yeah maybe five yeah <laughs> and uh you know and, and then you can run however many you have and then you can accumulate and you can get more validators over time um, but i think 10 is a decent number honestly me too i think that's perfect yeah, I think especially, I know a lot of you guys are, are running them at home. Uh, I'm, I'm known for one of the few running them in the cloud. And yes, uh, PLS price is going down. The ROI, ugh, ugh, right now. But I, I am exploring some other uh, cheaper cloud providers right now, which are a little frustrating, but working on that too. But I want to ask, I want this good problem to have, uh, that we may have in the future, who knows, of the prices go up more than where they are now. Now that we've, you know, did the million X, did all that stuff, uh, what if it cost hundreds of thousand dollars to become a validator? Is that uh, are we hard forking or uh, like right now? It's more likely the other way of like, hey, we need to make it more expensive to be a validator. It's too many. It's too affordable right now with the prices. But yeah, in the in the future, what if prices go up? Is it rock? And I, Ethereum Alex, has like five hundred thousand. Ethereum has like five hundred thousand validators. I mean, yeah. looking at the math my, with my personal assumptions, like we're maybe. 200 and that's like literally like you everybody who can be a validator is a validator and you're talking 200,000 validators and that's like less than half of what it's even on ethereum yeah um yeah. Well, ethereum just takes we're, we're, we're hitting 37,000 we're hitting 37,000 and around 40 50,000 is like a really good sweet spot for pulse chain because ethereum is like 15% validators based on the the amount of people who have tokens who could potentially be a validator mm, 
Okay. Fifteen percent for for in our ecosystem, it's like forty fifty thousand. So we're already approaching that now. So that's not a bad thing. Yeah. And then that, that gives everybody a better ROI, like more PLS per epoch for mining for validating themselves and earning that income. To like just like Ethereum proof of work, just like Bitcoin mining, right? And it's triple or quadruple the amount of inflation you're going to get from Ethereum to do the exact same work because Pulse Chain is the Pulse same mechanism. Is, yeah, right? we have like 25% extra fee burning in Pulse Chain, I think. So we have like even more burn than they do. Yeah. So the nuance with that one to, for the audience is you you take the amount of inflation that a validator would normally get because it's the same as Ethereum before they get credited it, they get, they get subtracted 50% like in the contract, like before it even gets credited to your balance. Yeah. So it can even go into your wallet. It gets like off the top burnt, yeah. subtracted 25%, yeah. which is the same as like a 25% burn. Um, it's just a nuance there, right? That you don't even see it. So it's not a burn mechanism you can see right on chain yep. because those tokens like never existed. So it's just 25% easier for us to become net deflationary as opposed to Ethereum as a percentage because obviously our token, you know, count is a little higher, is like larger and everything. Yeah. But and I, I like think a slight like nuance there. Launch, launchpad.pulsechain.com, they show that percentage on there. I don't think that takes into account that 25%. So right now it says 17%, but I'm, I'm only, my, based on my calculations, we're making like 13 to 14. So 12% just, depends on, um, yeah. depends on what your validator is doing, like 30, 31, 32 PLS per day. Um, so I say 12%, but then it could be more like 13 yeah, or higher more. because if you're in a sync committee, you get more. Yes. And so your your validator could, could be earning like more than the than the lowest amount. The the lowest amount that anybody's gonna be making in PLS right now in percentage terms is like twelve percent. Yep. A little I, slightly. I proposed, the block, I proposed the block the other day. Feels amazing, man. Feels amazing. Yeah, 170 X or something like that. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. Sometimes, man, the, the largest block reward I've seen so far, and it wasn't me, it was one of my clients. Dude, it was 1.2 million pulse on a on a gas oh. fee. That's some. I think somebody. Must oh yeah, I've gotten like sixty thousand. Six thousand. Yeah, well, I've seen. I've seen 60, like sixty thousand. I got sixty thousand the first 60, week. That's a good one. I've mm -hmm. seen a quarter. I've gotten. I've gotten myself a quarter million pulse block, and I've seen a 1.2 million, which I feel like somebody just goofed up yeah. in their MetaMask and spent too much gas. <laughs> uh, and and I I have I'm not looking at like every block, so I don't know. But I just noticed that one that first week that was pretty high. Feels good. So yeah. I'm sure so, I'm getting every once in a while a decent amount too. Yeah. Just so for, for people out there in the audience are listening, like your validators randomly, you it's your turn to mine a block, right? Or you, you propose the block, we call it. We don't call it mining, it's proposing. And that's when you stamp your graffiti, which is like a little custom, you know, tag that you put in the block. And then you get the roof, the fee recipient reward. Like it's it's the it's in the block, and it goes that goes directly into your rewards wallet after you hit it. And sometimes when the gas fees are real high on Pulse Chain, those pay out big. They're awesome. It could be sixty thousand. Yeah, you get the that's the priority fee. Yeah. So if so, the gas fees are really high, like incredibly high. All that's burned immediately, so that people can be aware of that. But then that. If, if gas fees are really high, then people are also going to pay a priority fee that's really high. And then you get that as a, as a validator that mine the block, produce the block, whatever, publish the block, you get yeah. that priority fee. And that's, that can be quite substantial sometimes because you talk a couple hundred transactions and they're all paying higher than normal priority fee to try and get their transaction into the block. And then you just pocket all that money. Mm -hmm. It's a tip for you to do, you know, please, kind sir, add the, my transaction to your block. Yep. Bingo. Yeah, I, I don't know who you else is like them and you got the fee. I don't know who else is pointing their priority fees to like a hot wallet or whatever, but I, I think it's pretty cool to, to, to look at it too. And then even 
I don't know. I was adding it into my, in my uh, APR. I was like, I think I was measuring 16 or 17%, mm -hmm. including the priority fees because they were, they were much more than I thought they would be. They were like 10% of the earnings was priority. I'm like, what? I didn't expect, I thought it'd be like 3% yeah. or something like yeah. that. People That's are paying it. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm running, like, I mean, mine's, mine's a hardware wallet, but then I got my withdrawal go into a hardware wallet and then I got the priority fee going to a hardware wallet. And like, so like, I'd have to look and see. I mean, so it's like the bare minimum takes 12% and then you're getting a couple percentages on top of that. And then sometimes you get this big, you get this, like you won the jackpot and you got like a million TLS. You're like, Oh my God, that's awesome. Yeah, jackpot. Go through, go through, go through transaction. Go through. And you look so happy. Yes. Right, you're like that's one thirty-two uh, thirty-second of a validator. Ching ching, oh man, and like instantly too. Yeah, like, right. Your wallet, I, oh, I love it. I love, I love being a validator. This is the best mining I've ever done in my like whole crypto career. Like we're we're using the least amount of electricity. You know, if if you've got a little nook, it's only using like thirty watts on average. Mm -hmm. You know, like it, it takes nothing, and, and then. Even the cost of the stakes. I mean, now they're yeah, two thousand bucks, fifteen hundred bucks. Yeah, I mean, Ethereum was less efficient. My electricity bill was crazy. You know, Bitcoin was just as bad, if not worse, way back in the day. Yeah, I, I, I'm obsessed. This is my obsession. I love pulse chain validating. Yeah. It's all I think about. It's all I do now. This, this is like my full time job, and I think I recommend it to everybody who's into pulse chain. Absolutely, you got, you got to try yeah. it. The, the hardest it. part about validating. Hardest part about validating is just getting set up. Whichever yes. method you have, like RH Max's script, David Feeder's guide, my guide. Like I have a difference between a guide and a script. I think a script is automated. Mm -hmm. Like you run a command and then it does stuff for you, and then you have a guide that gives you the commands. And you have to copy and paste them in. That's a difference. Yep. But like he's got a guide. I have a guide. You have a script. Awesome. Like however you know it takes you, and then once you get it set up, you have to monitor it. And then look at your effectiveness, which is like, how well are you doing? And then sometimes you got to do some, some local hardware, like networking, like my, myself, I've run validators forever and my effectiveness was like terrible. And I was like, why, why is it so bad? Peers were crap. My effectiveness was like an 80%. I was like, what's going on here? Well, I, I hardline my um, validator into my router because on testnet, I could run it on Wi-Fi, like no problem, 100% effectiveness, nothing going on. Testnet and mainnet, the, the load on your computer is much different, wow. much higher. The stresses on it are higher. So you can run perfectly fine on testnet. You move to mainnet and find that there's like some issues. Yeah. So I had to do port forwarding, which is, if you don't know what that is, if you, the peers like, RH Max's validator wants to talk to my computer, connect to me, and it knows my IP address and knows my port. Well, for it to hit my IP address, it's got to be routed through my router to my machine. Why well, I have to tell my router that I'm port 30303, which is the port for GEF. When you look, when you say IP address, me, port 30303, then it will route to my validator. Mm -hmm. And then now you're connecting to mine validator. And that adds like that increases my peer count because external validators can now connect to me and I can connect to them hopefully. And so that just immediately I went from two peers to like 30, like immediately yeah. just because the external peers could actually connect to me now. Yes. And then I connected my uh, like Ethernet cord, right? Validator hard, hard connected via internet to my router and then now, because it was hard routed, there was a lot more bandwidth because Wi-Fi isn't as good as like a hard line. Um, and then like instantly just fixed my problems. And I didn't, need, I didn't need to do any of that when I was on testnet. But I had to do it on mainnet. Wow. But yeah. I was like, yeah. oh, what are two things I haven't done yet? Well, I didn't do those two things. So I did it, immediately fixed my problem. And these wow. are things that you don't need to do unless there's an actual problem. So I don't recommend people go through and try and fix things that aren't broken. <laughs> Wait for I, there to be a problem. And then you can say, hey, these are my problems. And I can go, okay, well, here's three things that work for me. You can try them and see if they work for you. And then some people are like, well, they didn't work for me. I was like, well, then you have something else going on with your network or whatever. Yes. And we got to figure that out. Yep. 
I completely agree. Yeah, but by default, yeah, I don't I don't have people open the ports on their router unless they're running in the same problem with you did with low peer count, low attestations. Exactly. Yep. Because they never need to do it before. Yeah. You and even for there was like a yeah maybe it was two or three months ago. Ethereum had a special patch to increase uh, the the peers without needing to open your ports, which is pretty cool. Mm-hmm. So, so you can be behind a firewall with closed ports, and you should find a couple peers. Um, now, me personally, I am opening my firewall. I've got por- the ports coming in, so that way it's tons of connections, and it's it's working great. Um, one thing I did find out, I've done a little testing recently. I removed it from my, you know, guide um, that putting your WAN IP address it for the beacon container where it, it advertises your like internet, your modem IP address from your, your internet provider. I've actually found that does actually help find more peers. It's true. Now, here's one trick you can do. Most people, they don't, um, when you're, for the folks at home, you got your cable modem from like Comcast. Well, that, that has an IP, in, like an IP address number. Well, that number will change every time you turn off your modem. So there's a website. It's called noip.com, and you can sign up with those guys for a free account, and no cost, and they give you like a .com, and the .com, we, I found out we can use a DNS host name in our validator script, and it'll always point the .com to your house's IP address or, or whatever you're hosting, and it works, and it helps you find more peers. So I, I still owe the world a new video, which I'm going to do so as soon as I get back to my home after here being here in Austin, like in a couple of days, I'm going to do a, a brand new guide. And I think I'm going to include how to sign up for a, a no IP account and how to like get, get yourself like a free dot com, basically, because I think I think it helps. I didn't even think about that. You could use DNS for Yeah. But only caveat with that, you need to keep that up to date, right? When your IP address changes, you need to go change that to make sure it's still pointing to the, the current one. But you don't need to change it on the validator side because you're using DNS, right? Uh, correct. And there, well, there's even a little piece of software you can download for Windows or Linux that will automatically keep it up to date for you. So you never have cool. to manually touch anything. It just automatically keeps the .com up to date. Yeah. Modern world stuff. I don't know. Yeah, every, once in a while, yeah. every once in a while, I'll have to tell people about new IP. Yeah. And then if you have a video on it, then I can direct it to you because like, I've soon. never used that new IP. So... I mean, and I also like in my my thing. You can see my address, my email, or not my email, but my website is there. And I will also be doing new videos next week. Um, and I got to really hit up. Uh, I probably have a list of five or six videos I got to do. Um, Pulse chain launch problems with what X Y Z. I was on vacation for two weeks. Now I'm in the conference, and then I'm going to start hitting it hard, um, trying to push out some really good content. So um, that's my Substack, a website where I have a bunch of educational content that's on Fetch reporting, which we can't talk about right now. We don't have time for that. Uh, but I'll talk about Fetch reporting, which will which will be on really soon. We can talk about it for um, a bit cool. sec. Like so. Yeah, yeah. So soon. Liquid Loans is developing a fork of Teller, which is price oracles for Pulse Chain native, native to Pulse Chain for th- apps to use uh, Liquid Loans, Power City. Whatever it's an aggregate PulseX, uh, any exchanges that have assets, you can you can add uh, any assets on Pulse Chain to it. You add the price feeds from whatever APIs that are going to be providing the price. Um, Fetch oracles are decentralized network that will aggregate. You can earn fees. Fetch token inflation plus pri- like fees for for you know people need a price feed for whatever reason yeah and then you can provide it for them and get paid for that um i'm super bullish so that'll be coming out it's on testnet oh yeah i'm totally gonna be running uh, tele reporters i'll be doing content on it similar yeah. to pulse chain validators so it's yeah. like fetch Here. reporters pulse chain validators are literally the only thing i'm doing i think it's enough totally and i've got i've got a question so you know for, what you get from me for sure for the, do you think it'll be possible to run a fetch oracle and a pulse chain validator on the same Linux box at the same time. You can. Going? Okay. They don't use the same ports, which would be the only conflict. Oh. Um, I don't recommend it because okay. I think a pulse chain validator could only ever be used for a pulse chain validator. 
Like, and it's also like the similar is like, you don't want to be a pulse invalidator on your work computer or you want to, like, you know, you don't want it something where like you have your laptop where you're, you have to take on vacation and like the things literally got to sit in the corner, always be on. You check on it like a couple times a day. Yeah. You're good to go. And then the fetch reporter should be like, it can, like I'm learning more about it and I'll learn more about it once uh, it's fully deployed on testnet with rewards and the fees and, and price feeds and it's fully live on testnet. Um, but you can, you can run a reporter right now. You can run the client, get it installed, learn how to do it. And then like later on update it and the network will like come alive. But I just want to say that should be just, like another computer in your house. Just, just on that too. Yeah. I think more software, more problems. I always tell people use a clean box, only run, do one thing on it at a time server. Yeah. You know, back in the old days we'd run like database server, mail server, web server on the same machine. <laughs> and it's like, Yes, you can do that. But if anything, you need to reboot because one needs to update or some has some problem or one thing takes the other thing down. Now you're losing PLS too. So like, yes, yeah, better to well, separate. And like, here's the thing. If you do it on both, right. tell her you need to reboot your machine for whatever reason, because tell her now you just put your, your blockchain validator offline for however long, because if you reboot your blockchain validator, you got to do it in a certain way make sure that you're gracefully shutting down so that it'll save the database so that you're not losing five days of data, like blockchain data. Yeah. It takes you hours to resync up and you're you're losing income and you're offline. That's not helpful for the network. Now, if there is a problem and then vice versa, like if you're have a problem with your pulse chain validator, you got to reboot reboot that. Now you brought down your teller reporter and now you're not both of them are on the same machine. And like, I'm not recommended at all. Uh, and excellent. it's like, okay, Thank you. You're creating problems with your teleporter. <laughs> yeah, you, you, you're, you can do it. You can, for right. sure. But, but you can even do a teleporter from we're your house. We're going to tell no everybody problem. no. Yeah. Yep. No, yeah. Tell I mean, I, mean, I, mean, I, mean, I, I like to say, different. honestly, technically, you can do it and not recommend it at all. Okay. All right, cool. Well, yeah, let's go with let's not do it then. Let's, I'm going to tell everybody we're not going to do, do it. it. Let's keep our validators and our and oracles separate. No. Two nuts. Perfect. That's, that, that's yeah, yeah. You, you get two, and it's a very lightweight infrastructure for telereporting. Like the bare minimum is like four gigs of RAM. Being a blockchain validator is like 32 gigs of RAM. Is like the bare minimum, I would say, is like do it. People were like, well, I can do it on 16 gigs of RAM. I was like, okay, if you can run a blockchain validator on like a G laptop or a G like microwave, then like that's awesome. Not recommended though. Yeah, sixteen gigs of RAM. Like, like, you can technically do it, laptop, but you're going to be a like, shitty validator. Wow, uh, do you want to lose? Do you want to? You want your attestation to be sixty percent? Like, why? Why just? I don't. I, I don't want that. No, it, so. You're going to run out of RAM. It's you're going to have problems. It's yeah. Just don't do it. It's like there's but there's a few people that I want to be experimental. I was like, okay, but you being experimental. Don't screw over everybody else who are noobs who are trying to figure out how to do it for the first time. Don't tell them, oh, you can totally do it on 16 gigs of RAM because I was able to do it. I'm like, okay, were you able to do it at scale with no problem with hundreds of validators or whatever over like a three-month period? No, I could get I can get it to work on 16 gigs of RAM, but am I recommending that? No, oh, yeah. because I wouldn't run my own validator on 16 gigs of RAM. Why would I recommend that? Yeah, RAM's cheap. I mean, it, you know, it's I personally cheap. want to run 64 gigs of RAM yes, to future proof my validator for the bull market. So it's like it's not being used. It's like the utilization is very low on my validator. Yes. But that's okay because in two years from now, my validator is going to run perfectly fine Bingo. because I've already done the things to make the internet work well. I got a battery backup, I have enough RAM, enough CPU. No problem. Yep. I can put as many validators as I want on my machine. And I think in the bull market, when everything is going hopefully very well in two years, lots of usage, no, whatever's going on, great, good to go. Yep. Gamma calling right. it here. We need one terabyte to run a validator in 2025 because transactions are going to be insane, insane. One terabyte of RAM, you're going to need it. To process yeah, I mean, that. you can run one terabyte. Um, I've heard – that if you put uh, one terabyte terabyte of RAM on an Aragon node, then it will sync incredibly fast. Wow. Okay. People, somebody's done that. 
That's cool. I don't know. That's real cool. Yeah. Not recommended because that's super expensive. And it, and <laughs> that's so not a powder cool. setup. That's uh, like I'm gonna throw I'm gonna throw uh, the kitchen sink at get an area node synced up as fast as possible uh, for reasons that aren't and a validator. <laughs> but yeah. so I was at I think, 32 yeah. gigs of RAM. Since you guys are doing uh, content next week too, I might as well do AMA number twenty six or something like that. I think uh, there's more. There's some pretty cool stuff to talk about, especially here. Like you guys, and and I just want to say shout out to Dip Slayer too, who has an awesome uh, set of scripts. I know a lot of people use too. You know, he's not on the panel today, but he does a lot of really cool work, and uh, appreciate his stuff yeah. as well. Yeah, yeah. I, I well, I will say one thing. Okay, and I'll be honest, the scripting is like it's great. But if you don't understand what's happening in the script and you have a trouble, you have to troubleshoot new people, you're like, okay, awesome. You were able to get up and running. And then now you're, now it's not working. You're losing all your money and you're, you're freaking out and you used a script. Well, do you understand like how it functions? That's why I personally like guides, but also guides don't really give you that good of an understanding of what's happening under, under the hood. So whether you use a guide, whether you use RH Max's script, you really need to understand like what it is doing. Right. And you you are actually building from source, which I do for my own validator, but my guides are using Docker. Mm -hmm. oh. And so a lot of people are having problems with Docker, which isn't even a validator problem. That's a you're using Docker for the first time, which I also had a problem using Docker for the first time, because I rather would build from source. And then I do system services and I have all that stuff because I've been doing Linux forever. And like Docker wasn't a thing that I ever needed to use. Yeah. But Docker is awesome for automation. And it's awesome for uh, standardization, when, especially when you're doing guides and stuff. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think just one other thing too, I always recommend for people who before they get started with validating is if you don't know anything about Linux or command line, go take like a, I, I tweeted it like a 10 series tutorial, like five or 10 minute increments. Just learn how this stuff works because if you don't know how to use basic commands, it can be very hard for you to do anything on a validator, let alone set one up with whether you have a script or not. So please just take an hour to learn about Linux if you don't know much about it before you get into this. But after that, fun stuff, fun yeah. stuff indeed. Sure. I will say one thing. I'm going to be doing more online content. So if you guys want to talk to me about this stuff at any time, like give me a few days heads up and I'm more than willing to come online and we can just chat about it and Everyone's eyes can bleed from the tech discussion that we can't get into right now. <laughs> um, all about validating all public information, of course. Well, y you guys are uh, certainly, you know, like earning a lot of respect from the entire community by volunteering to educate others. And I think it's part of the reason why Pulse Chain stands out so much as being decentralized is everybody's just kind of hanging out and, uh, you know, teaching others, paying it forward and that sort of thing. And so thank you to all of you uh, who have been on this panel. As Richard said, you do the work. You do the work. <laughs> I take that shit seriously. Now, hey, if you haven't seen The Highest of Stakes, go watch it. I watched it yesterday. It's a fantastic movie. Yeah. That's so good. Um, I got to plug it. It's a good movie. Yeah, please do. And uh, now where can people find you guys? Yeah, so you can find me at... Uh, validatorstore.com that's where i've got my tutorials hardware cloud hosting and then i'm just david feeder on twitter and david feeder on youtube yep i got my website is right there uh, gamma so just think of the four as, a, as an a my hacker name <laughs> I know that was funny um so that's my website that's my sub stack all my educational material are there and then my twitter is at this what's on the screen G4MM4IO. And then I have a YouTube, and I do live streams on YouTube, but not like that many. It's mostly like commentary, updated news. Uh, but most of my really important stuff is on my Substack. You can sign up for free. Uh, there's a paid, you know, sign up for a paid subscription. That's awesome. Not required. Everything on there will be free after a couple weeks of it. Like I do a video, it's for my paid subscribers. And then after that, it's free. Oh, cool. Right. So you don't have to pay for anything if you don't want to. You can just sign up for free and get it. Like, no big deal. Awesome. All my stuff, all my stuff is on Twitter, at RHMaximal. It's just the way it sounds. It's spelled on the screen. And the RHMax YouTube channel. The guy said I do AMAs and 
and have a lot of content and try to clip as much stuff as I can. And, uh, got the script. Uh, go, go to tinyurl.com slash go validate. tinyurl.com slash go validate. That'll hit the first page of my blog, which is the introduction on uh, how validating, how to do the scripts, and it'll point you to the video and, and uh, tutorial and stuff like that. But these two gentlemen above me, uh, I've learned a lot from their content, and uh, I've been following them for a long time. So they, uh, they definitely helped me get my head around how to even uh, do, do this stuff to, to write a script. So shout out to them for sure. Uh, we got a lot of good people working on stuff. I'm like 130 followers. <laughs> I'm 130 followers from 5,000 on Twitter. Hit me up on Twitter. All right. Yeah, I'm like a big round number, man. <laughs> and thank you, Maddie, for the bad number. Yes, thanks for having us. Oh, Appreciate my it. pleasure. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, thanks, guys. We'll catch you next time. Bye, cool. I'll be down on the meeting. Bye, bye. <laughs> bye, 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 bye. We are out. <laughs> See you guys.